silence. silence. All along the watchtower, there was silence. Guns trained on prison yards in the dead of the night, there was silence. Silent night, unholy night. The quiet of death. Revolutionaries killed while they slept. And not enough people wept. Or even knew it happened. You keep quiet now. You tell anyone what I did. Look, just don't tell no one what happened here. Stop that crying or I'll give you something. I'm not crying Quiet. The walls scream in hostile houses and neighbors can't help but know. Children go without sleep. Mothers go to work with relocated noses. Purple and yellow ribbons cover cheeks and thighs, backs and shoulders. War wounds. But we won't talk about the undeclared wars here. Shh. Keep it hush hush. On the down low. For the low down, traffic is backed up a serious wreck. It appears that Plymouth Rock has landed on us. Land where ancestors died. Prophets all crucified from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. Who's ringing those damn bells? Turn that mess off. Tragedy strikes today in a terrible accident. He did it on purpose, Mom. Mom. I've got a migraine for centuries. Why can't they just keep quiet? All quiet on the Western Front. You take this time to think about what you did. Children turn their faces towards the east, towards blank walls and timeouts, outside time constraints of commercial breaks. But somewhere, not so far away. Somewhere over the rainbow. Bombs are dropping on babies. From way up high. Mixing the screams of children and missiles. And then, silence. But we can't be quiet. We gotta scream and be heard. No, no justice, justice, no peace. No, no justice, justice, no peace. Red, white, and blue suckers done stole the soul. And my ancestors can't rest because their deaths and burials weren't proper. Cast to these big waters, but the spirits can't drown. And I will not be silent. Because I was buried in the shallow grave and unhallowed ground. In the midst of lies, brutality, and justice, scandal, and straight up bullshit, the prosecution would have you, the jury, believe that Mumia Abu Jamal, critically wounded at the time, was able to rise. Silence. Up. You may now come to order. You may now buckle under law and order. I I threw out the appeal on the grounds of my not having enough coffee. Freeze, nigger, drop to the ground. You have the right to remain silent. We have had that right for over 500 years. We would like to trade it in for our stolen voices. Sorry, no refunds, returns, or exchanges without the proper receipt. No search or seizure without probable cause. But we got some reasonable doubts and some serious suspicions that... <laughs> We're sorry you have reached a number that has been disconnected. Hey, don't call me. I'll call you. Wait until we call on you. Call in response. Berimbo in a red belt. Chanting change, because next time, we're, we're going to take, take more folks, folks with, with us. us. If you got to go, go with a bang. We interrupt this program. Man, turn that crap off. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you listening? So we are good sister, bad sister. We like to just come up and yell silence. It's fun. I did it in a classroom of students one time. I was like, silence! And they were like, no, she didn't. I was like, it's part of the poem. It's OK. And then they were like, oh. It's poetic. So I am, uh, I'm Walida. I'm the bad sister. I'm Taria. I'm the so-called good sister. <laughs> we're just going to change the name to bad sister, worse or sister. Or like bad sister squared. Uh, we're not sure. We're, we're debating. We're working on it. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we, uh, we definitely are excited to be here at the Peace Conference, and it's been a great day, and I appreciate, you know, the folks who took the workshop, all the energy you did writing and, um, and continuing that energy and being here. Um, and so it's, it's uh, that first piece was sort of, you know, that idea of using our voices, right, and this idea that there are so many forces that try to silence us in so many ways and that we've got we to gotta push through regardless of what it is. Um, exactly. Right. That. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know why I just like I know, I'm that. like, am I in church? <laughs> yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You. Sorry. I, I like being the preacher. Um, so, um, so this next poem is actually called Prison Industrial Complex. And um, we've both done work around the, uh, gone into prisons. And um, I've done a lot of work around, um, around prisons and teach a class. We both teach at Portland State University about prisons and the history of incarceration connecting prisons to slavery, um, because prisons are a direct outgrowth of slavery in this country. The institutions of prison come from slavery. And the institutions of policing come from um, slave catchers. So when people ask, you know, well, don't you believe that the police system can be reformed? I say, mm -hmm. I didn't think that slavery could be reformed. We just had to throw that shit out and start anyway. So uh, we started out. 
Again, that's my bias. So this poem When you're is, right, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you, Sister Taria. Um, so this poem is Prison Industrial Complex. High density solutions to widespread problems. Lives lived for irrelevance. Born in a circumstance, because the world is rough. And people are difficult enough to deal with, but separated by iron bars and barbed wire. And 15 minute phone calls that are interrupt interrupted every three minutes so some automated voice can tell you. You are talking to an inmate. Just to remind you constantly who has the power. And that it isn't you. To be ripped apart by rejected letters because you didn't read the regulations close enough. To have your visit cut short because the metal detector went off arbitrarily and the guards took all day searching you. To reach across this void of distance and pain and time. Jesus, Jesus, especially, especially time, time, that drips from clocks like spit from the mouths of rabid dogs. To carry all this on human shoulders seems like it should be outlawed by the Constitution, seems beyond cruel and unusual punishment, and yet so familiar as 2.7 million. Become 270 million. Become, become all, all of us. us. Trapped by 13th Amendment loopholes. Slavery, for servitude, bondage are outlawed except in the case of punishment. On television screaming blood and fear and pat answers. On legislative floors and ballot boxes, honest, good, upright citizens cast their vote for bigger and badder and tougher so they can sleep at night, so they can forget. So we can forget the historical race fears. Scared, scared of our own, own skin sometimes. sometimes. Skinned of history. Skimmed off of history. And beaten into the flesh of capital. Where flesh becomes the capital on Wall Street stock markets. And we are sweated out of ghettos to pool on street corners, finally to bleed into prison yards. While we, the people, the public consumers, are psychologically manipulated by commercials between shots of bloody murder. We begin to have edible dreams about our mother country and our fatherland. Schizophrenic behavior is the norm as we realize this, this country has, has a serious prison industrial complex and getting more serious every minute as they build industrial complexes around our bodies sensing off our minds until we have to ask the president for a shit break and our landlord doles out our daily smoke until we don't know there's any other way until we think that this, this is, is freedom. freedom but those behind bars can still say you ain't free you ain't free from yourself and you sure as hell ain't free from us we need a day we need a day to rescue freedom from the dugout where it had been sent after three strikes and you're our outlaws permanently retired it from the game. A day to say, lend me some air so that I might breathe without the stench of death clogging my lungs. The cry wasn't even, get me the hell out of here. It was, let me not have to wear someone else's dirty underwear. Let me not have to eat food with mold growing on it. Let me touch my child's face without having to look at them from behind glass because shatterproof glass distorts the faces of families and of strangers, and it mutates my face into a mask of rage. And when that happens, Attica, Attica, Attica. 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 We resurrect Haitian slave revolts, maroon skulking through jungles. Metamorphosized into prison blues, skulking through sweatshops, encased in steel, supplanted in America's heartland. And hell no, not in our backyard, become. So what kind of tax break do you need to speed up the construction? As the all-American high school quarterback marries the prom queen, settles down to live the dream, and realize what seems like a doorway to opportunity is really a path to insanity because a man does carry his work back home with him. And the pressure of being cruel enough, bad enough, mad enough, it doesn't stay at the jail when he clocks out. Wives and children that get out of line have to be corrected and corrections have nothing to do with supportive notes scrawled in the margins. Brutality is the quick fix methodology and he's been trained to, to hit, hit where it counts. counts. Keeping folks submissive is part of his job description and violence is unfettered and unconfined by razor wire. Flying high to come home to roost under declining crime statistics juxtaposed with prison populations. Populated by dark, black, brown, poor faces. Faces too dark to see the features anymore. So now crime has no face. And who are the men behind the robes? Who's behind the prison blues and the prison grays? The prisoner and the guard both trapped in uniform convictions, sentenced by juries whose faces are always hidden. But the verdict is always the same. Guilty. Guilty. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I was going to do a poem about an organization called Take Back the Land. Um, does anyone here know about Take Back the Land? <laughs> that you know about it because I told you, that's cheating. Uh, <laughs> or it's being an amazing perceptive student. Um, so Take Back the Land is an incredible organization based in Miami, Florida. I'd encourage everyone to, uh, to check them out because I think one of the things about Tria and my poetry is that you know, we write about really heavy topics and I think the thing that fuels us is, is, is art but is also seeing the creative ways that people are making changes like the slideshow is just so inspirational to get to see all of these creative manifestations. So Take Back the Land, um, right now what they're doing is they're a 
land-based organization that talks about self-determination in the black community specifically. So they say that the black community should have the right to control the land in their community. Um, Miami has the highest, Florida has one of the highest foreclosure rates in the country. I think they're number two. And so um, basically in the city of Miami, there's, um, I think it's 5,200 abandoned homes, and there's, I think, 4,700 families that need housing. So as they say, as Take Back the Land says, we combine peopleless homes with homeless people. So what they do is they, they break into foreclosed houses or bank-owned houses, they take them over, they change the locks, um, you know, people enter through the front door, they're not squatting, they're, they're basically taking back what is rightfully theirs. They talk to the neighbors, to the community members, um, and a lot of times, you know, they, they said every time the community has been so supportive of them because otherwise, you know, these vacant houses are sitting on their block and, and instead they get families that move in, who clean up, who are neighborly, who are friendly. They actually got a call, um, Max Remo, who's the director, said he got a call on the phone one day and it was a, it was a, a wealthy white woman from this very wealthy white community and they don't do work there, but she instantly busts into this tirade and she's like, there's this house that's on the block that's been abandoned, it's been two years, it's tore up and I want you to move someone into it right now, you need to do something about this. And he's like, ma'am, do you know where you've called? This is a radical organization that takes back houses. And she's like, yeah, I know. Come take the house back. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of talking about, you know, strange bedfellows, but the idea, you know, the idea again is this idea of community building. So, um, but before they started taking back houses, they actually took over um, some property owned by the city of Miami and they built um, a community on it. It's a shanty town that they call the Moja Village, Unity Village. And they housed over 200 people in a six month period. And the people ran the community, they built their houses, they decided how decisions were made. Um, you know, and a lot of folks felt really empowered, learned to be, you know, organizers, learned to trust their own, you know, sort of internal processes, not so much learning how to be organizers, but recognizing what they already knew, that they were organizers. Um, six months almost to the day that it was built, it was burned to the ground in a mysterious fire. Um, so I wrote a poem um, about that, about sort of the burning and the response, because I think when we, when we um, have setbacks, I think we often sort of just shut down as a movement, and I think we need to recognize. One of the things that inspires me about Take Back the Land is they were like, okay, where do we go from now? And they didn't just replicate the same model. They weren't like, we'll seize another land, we'll build another shanty town. They were like, conditions have changed. We have to shift with them. So this is sort of my, uh, my ode to Emoja Village called Take Back the Land. The melted plastic face of a doll and a dream. Charred edges of tattered novels and hope. The taste of burnt wood and freedom in our mouths dry as cotton bowls. Stoplight. Police faces flashing red. Crying baby fists pummeling nothing, not even air. The destruction of a home the shredding of a soul. We will rebuild. The sun flashes through the skin of our backs, window shades. Our bones packed with straw, clay, mortar, insulation. Our blood waters wildflowers, unsanctioned beauty disrupting the continuity of concrete. This land knows us. Breath tangled in tree branches, tongue planted in soil. This land wants to come home to us. Tobacco fields, northern factory floors, ancestors' eyes, project windows. Somewhere, a black girl plants a seed, cupped hands unfurling dirt across the span of her cheeks. This land, this land will take us back. I realized the introduction was like eight times longer than the poem. <laughs> Um, so this poem is called Military Targets, and um, you know, it's, a, it's about the situation in Palestine, um, and uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, we've, we've sort of, we've got to talk about history, you know, and, uh, and sort of work from that framework. Um, I was a history major, so I sort of see everything through a historical lens, so, and I think seeing the interconnections of struggles is really important. Again, they try and break us off into these boxes that are isolated, but really these struggles all flow together. They say they only bomb military targets. Only military targets, they coo soothingly. We are not terrorists, setting bombs and stealing planes and stabbing at the night which asphyxiates and poisons. We have clean shirts and clean hands, and we sterilize our instruments before we operate. Israeli soldiers invaded Ramallah today. 
I only know this because a white activist told me so. He said, Israeli soldiers invaded Ramallah today, and I'm so depressed, I can't go out to dinner with you guys. I'd rather sit in silent contemplation of a Jack Daniels bottle. I told him to remember to pour out a little liquor for our Palestinian homies. He told me my humor at a time like this was inappropriate. Liberals shake their heads and from towers of privilege cluck the appropriate nothings that fall from their lips like diarrhea. It is so sad. It is a tragedy. There must be peace. We must stop the violence in the Middle East, which rose from nowhere, like a mushroom cloud, without memory, no culpability, no anger, only depression. In a space where people turn their bodies into bombs rather than have their tongues ripped asunder, your depression is inappropriate. When children protect their homes against tanks armed only with rocks and righteous rage, your depression is inappropriate. When the Israeli army uses foreign journalists as target practice to further a media whiteout, your depression at a time like this is inappropriate. And Tony Cade Bambara said depression is collaboration with the enemy. But you, never ha you still haven't decided which side you're on. Well, you better choose now because as you keep telling me, we are at war. We are at war with terrorism. Translation, Islam, brown people, self-determination, freedom, dissent. Don't forget about that war on drugs. We're close to winning that one soon. Bring our boys home from slum streets and ghetto Gaza strips where youth are armed with rocks and glocks and misdirected righteous rage. Doublespeak is the order of the day obscuring the difference between martyr and murderer. We didn't come here to kill. We came to die. Whispers of Lolita Lebron for we are the already Jed. Slaughtered child soldiers, bullet-ridden refugees, tortured freedom fighters. We refuse to lie silent in our mass unmarked graves, hidden from the harsh light of history. Trust us, they say. Give history to us, they say. Give history to our blood-stained hands and we will purify it, burn it clean with our bleach. It's a simple procedure, really. Deny the creation and you deny the occupation. Deny the existence and the resistance. Deny the innocent who died, so you deny the genocide. Deny the war games, deny the family names. They were too difficult for newscasters to pronounce anyway. Most of all, deny the guns branded U-S-A. If you can't deny, never forget the password, catchword, code words, military targets. We only bomb military targets. The beat of a heart, the cry of a child, the slip of a trigger, the push of a button, the slip of a dollar, can turn a 10-year-old's decapitated body lying in the rubble and remnants of a ruptured hospital into a military target. So um, this next poem is called Wade in the Water, and it's, uh, it's about New Orleans, um, another heavier topic, um, but a very important one, actually. Teach a, I'm teaching a class right now at Portland State about Hurricane Katrina, and we're really talking about reframing the issues. You know, um, I, I had the opportunity to go down three weeks after Hurricane Katrina struck, and I did some volunteer work, and I also um, created a short documentary. And so I basically wrote this poem um, sort of like we were doing in, in, in the workshop using the senses, I wrote this poem to try and create a way for people to feel a little bit of what that was like, um, what it was like for me being there, what it was like um, hearing these stories. So everything in the poem is something I either saw or I interviewed someone about. Um, so again, this is a, I'm like, now I'm back in teacher mode. This is another way of using poetry as a sort of poetic journalism. Um, but I do, you know, I think it's important, again, like, um, you know, uh, Matthew Shinoda, whose poem we read, he said, poetry is, uh, is the art of economy, right? So if you don't have a camera and you don't have money and editing equipment, you can still write something down and in that way, take photographs, take film and things. There was still water standing six feet deep in people's homes two weeks after the flood. Through waters laced with chemicals and human excrement and bloated bodies, 
Black and brown people went out every day to save the kin left behind, shredded and discarded. King George said, let them eat flood water. <gasps> and they choked on the watery ashes of progress. Please, he said, standing in a canoe in what remained of the seventh ward, hands in the air, eyes trained on the hypnotic guns of four officers who minutes before had fired three shots that may or may not have been warnings. Please, he said, heart heavy in his mouth. I'm looking for the body of my son. Let me find my son's body. <sighs> the Mississippi River was dragged in the 60s to find the bodies of three civil rights workers murdered by the Klan. Dozens of human remains were found, all black, all nameless. They were unimportant to media coverage and bureaucracy and good race relations. So they were thrown back to the river. How many lives were submerged until they <gasps> stopped <gasps> kicking? The Mississippi is claiming the bodies of the lynched once again. And in a town two hours outside of New Orleans, corpses were unearthed from the graves set free to flow down the street. An old man sits on his porch. I built this house with my hands. Lived here 58 years with my wife till she died two years ago. I saw her casket in the water two weeks ago. I can't get nobody to help me put her back in the ground where she belongs so she can rest. Won't anybody help me? <laughs> Dear God, FEMA, please help us. Don't leave us here to die. Read the graffiti on a house completely surrounded by water. Two weeks and no relief. Three weeks and no aid. Four weeks and no FEMA. Yeah, they gave us something, the brother snorted. Dreads coiled and purring on top of his head. He was one out in boats every day taking people to the promised land of higher ground. On the fifth day, Red Cross dropped some hard rock candy on our heads. Don't let them tell you they never gave us nothing. And they gave them National Guard and the NYPD and the US Forestry Department and the INS and Border Patrol and the Office of Homeland Security and state troopers and detachments and battalions and tanks and automatic camps and work camps and concrete floors and nightsticks and blood and blood and blood and bullets and don't let them tell you they never gave us nothing. The waters have receded and this human tide trickles in. An old young woman stands in her decomposing house. Black mold coating the walls, baby pictures, high school diplomas. Her four daughters chase after their 11 collective children. She holds the youngest one in her arms, and he has nothing but wise eyes and heavy brow. Of course we're staying, she hefts the tiny sage to the other hip. I don't know what we're going to do. But this? This is ours. We won't leave it. And she does not mean this cramped house and dead yard out front. She means this, this spark of hope, soggy, <gasps> sputtering, <gasps> but burning out enough space. <gasps> <sighs> catch a breath. <laughs> so, um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, war and how these different battles like wage throughout the world. And one thing that we think is important, you know, as women and as women of color to really address the way that you know, war is not just what happens overseas, but it's also what happens day in and day out, um, and how it plays out, especially on women's bodies, whether it's here or abroad, because um, women are kind of always under attack. And when we look at, you know, people that are constantly being affected by all these tragedies, women and children are often the brunt of these horrific choices made by governments and powers that be. And reframing different things as war, right? I think we sort of hold the term war, you know, sacrosanct, and we use these definitions and all these kind of things. But I think, you know, we can take poetic license and human, human license to redefine any assault on humanity as a war. 
There was no declaration of war. We had no idea the destruction in store. The beaten lips and fractured bones, the burning beds and disintegrated homes. Battered wives or captured urban soldiers. Our minds, bodies, and lands taken over. Sisters flesh on killing fields, strange fruit, the only yield. The face that launched a thousand ships. Backs that bore the brunts of whips. The empire's wealth, a product of marketability based on love-hate relationships to, to the, the female, female body. body. Patriarch's pockets lined with the surpluses of misogyny. Our inferior status explained away as, as destiny. destiny. Sliced bellies from a bayonet or a back alley abortion. No SOS on the radio, only distortion. Little girls play house in war zones. Constant low intensity warfare of thinner hips, straightened hair, emaciated starving frames. Objectified, objectified bodies with, with no names. names. Napalm burn blistered roots, styles dictated by corporate suits. Whether it's heat seeking missiles fired in Iraq. Or cops shooting up the block. Ground zero radiates between swollen thighs, covered in dirty rags by politicians lies. Flags stuck into the flesh of my chest. Pipeline sucking sustenance from my breast for the sake of a godless newborn West. Because their survival takes precedent over all other inhabitants. And from the free world to the penitentiary, mothers are viewed as mere machinery to birth the future's military. Debased and devalued postpartum when Uncle Sam has no more use for them. Our pain is worn down past. And washed up futures. Our wounds are cauterized by machine gun sutures. They expect us to adopt their commandeering mentalities to match their conquistador fantasies. And white supremacist ideologies. Try to colonize our mindset. Even our flesh becomes suspect. We have a scorched earth policy when it comes to our bodies. Our beauty. Our psyches. If I can't have you, no, no one, one will. will. So jealous boyfriends cut brake wires and jilted superpowers start global fires. We become refugees in our own homes. No refuge in the demilitarized zone. The US bombed North Korea's DMZ for a year straight the land was strafed and split. Rebels build expo explosives from ash, dirt, and spit. But our weapons will be used placentas, flesh-colored magenta. Broken noses skewered by barbed wire and borders. Bodega built bombs. Broken glass glinting at dawn. Our skin cracked and, blue and bruised stretches as shelter. Attitudes and temperatures swelter. Our corpses stacked like wood. Genocide tactically, tactically understood. understood. Combat boots kick out our teeth as we struggle to speak our lived realities. More than just casualties because men fight wars on our bodies. It's, it's the, the only, only battlefield, battlefield they can always reach. But we are never obsolete. Some women warriors carry caches of weapons in their wombs, and we are all able to train and lead platoons. We economic commodities reject landmines implanted in our bodies. Force genetic modification. Inert bomb sterilization to stop the rise of a rebellious nation. We are the weapon we have wanted. The rock with which tanks are confronted. Landmines laying dormant until triggered by torment. We are the determination of the female martyr. Firstborn daughter, fire starters. Smoke on the sky. Our last breath will not die. We are all beautiful. We are all beautiful. We are all beautiful, we are all beautiful. But after 400 years without a comb, I began underestimating, negating, berating, and degrading my inner goddess. Denying my connection to the roots of happiness and nappiness, I was striving for a relaxed state in the midst of self-hate, constantly struggling to be someone else, constantly struggling to be something else. As if the face that I wake up with can't be the one I cherish. As if the body that I live in is never an accurate depiction of my aspiration. You see, I was unaware that my hair is an extension from the base of my thoughts through and beyond the spirals of the galaxy. And this lifetime serves as a tool to navigate the journey. Because I know the universe holds more for me and we than this. Suffering and hunger, misdistribution of wealth, forcing survival to equal distance from the earth, gunfire, destruction, prisons and war, drive through lifestyles and convenience stores. Colonizers decimated self-sustaining communities, force-fed dependency, and yes, I am yet another generation of addict barring against my life, while the debts owed from blood-soaked hands go unpaid, but we have not forgotten. The hysterical screams of the kidnapped, vicious blows, crippling backs, mothers stolen from babies, folks tied to train tracks, then beaten for struggling, burning flesh and broken bones, nails through hands and crowns of thorns. We carry the weight of the earth and attempt to save it, armed with slingshots and rocks. We aim for eyes to alter sight, impact vision, change the negative gravitation emanating from forced relocation, manipulations, and the few constantly seeking domination. 
I regain my natural rhythms and the spirals on my head, they serve as antennas, picking up signals from the sun, reminding me that while hundreds of years may mark empires, they are only a ripple in this vast ocean of time. So this lifespan of mine is neither beginning nor end. It's just brief time passing. And there are many more after and before me than I can ever comprehend, supplying no end to this mathematical equation of water and bone, flesh and dome, enabling me to use my vessel as a tool to write this poem. Knowing that hours spent reflecting and projecting positive energy, it returns threefold, and love is cosmically unending and eternally limitless. So I'm supplied in abundance, and I can share it with each and every one of you as a gift to which you've been deemed entitled without fine print and unbridled, because I know that you are more than this. First impressions, products of rejection influenced by the notion of the West, containing bitterness, weariness, lacking sleep, trapped in worlds we did not create that marks time with scars of rings cut deep. But finally, able to treat the wounds with knowledge predating carved runes, we begin that cataclysmic cipher, bringing dormant roots back to life. So I was, I was really blessed, and I mean, really, I feel like with even the various things that have happened in my life, I feel I, I've just been blessed as an individual. And um, one of many blessings was I had the opportunity to travel to Rwanda in 2004. And a story. So um, one of those intros that will be longer um, than the piece. So we went in 2004, and I remember, like, at first we weren't sure where um, the conference was going to be happening or where exactly would be, we would be. And, um, the men, and when we found out we were going to be in Rwanda, first it was everyone else's reaction to me telling them, I'm going to Rwanda this summer. Oh my gosh, you're going to Rwanda. And then it was like kind of this reading list that um, people were giving me. So you know, I was reading like King Leopold's Ghost, which is about how King Leopold decided, I too would like a colony. I want to make people slaves and profit off of that. And you know how um, you know, the government basically created all this disaster in that, you know, that region. Um, and then finally, I kind of had to take all of that and just set it down because I was like, this is gonna really taint my interaction with the people if this is the only part of the history that I'm aware of. So I kind of set it aside and I just went with the open heart. And the thing that I really didn't expect was how after all of this pain, all of this suffering, the many things that people had seen, you know, folks didn't talk about, oh, well, how many brothers and sisters do you have? Or, oh, how are your parents? Like, there's just certain conversations that don't hap happen because so many people have been lost. But what really, like, struck me to my core was how beautiful, amazing, inspiring, and loving people could still be after so much tragedy. And, um, we, had, um, we stayed in um, the capital city of Chigali, and then we were in Kibuye as well. And while we were there, we visited um, some of the mass graves. And you know, we were talking about this in the workshop, you know, how there's a difference between like, kind of theoretically reading and thinking about something that happened and then you know, really kind of being present in it. And to be at these massive graves, um, the one in Chigali, I believe it was um, you know, 100 and some thousand bodies that were buried you know, beneath our feet in these large, like kind of covered with concrete. And in um, Kabuye, the same thing, like you know, these huge mass graves. And you know, so as a writer, just being overwhelmed with that, I, I wrote about it. So there's two pieces. When Abel fell at the hands of Cain and spilled blood, stained the ground, did they know they were in paradise? When the birds share songs lending melody to their surroundings, is their sound the telling of the way the world went mad, or perhaps the release of joy that those times are over? Do the buried find peace with skeletons dismembered, lives disrupted with strokes of a blade since bullets were considered too expensive? When those in need who sought salvation at a church found the house of God had become their tomb, was there redemption for those who wielded the machete? Do Adam and Eve weep again as history repeats itself? How do we reconcile that Eden and hell are neighbors separated by a chain leak fence and barbed wire, unmarked mass graves in a courtyard sharing both sides in indecision? Is evil also a fallen seed that takes root with barbed spikes, laying claim on man and earth to harvest discontent? We, haphazard gardeners, consume whole and husk, choke on the yield, emaciated and forever hungry. 
Despair masks itself as sustenance. Hope lies in the hands of children asking me for Rwandan francs. My meager offerings cannot return their families. And this is the part two. So really quick, I just to say that um, it's really important that we, we oftentimes we look at um, like violence that is kind of like an in-house violence, the way that like maybe folks of color reenact violence on themselves. And then we put the blame on them without oftentimes really looking at the nature and the history of colonialism and the violence that it wreaked throughout the world and the influence that that had. So um, I just kind of wanted to say that you know, while yes, in Rwanda, you know, it might have been about, you know, kind of a nation state like Hutus, Tutsi, like the reality being that it was the colonialism that brought violence where, you know, people's hands and arms were being chopped off if they didn't do the work that um, was wanted um, by those who were colonizing. They were had like heads, people decapitated and put heads as warnings, like just so you know, rebellion isn't wanted here. So how does that then seep into the soil and into the blood and then, shape the future that comes from the people that are impacted by it because um, it's a lot more than what you see currently. It's like Walida said, it's so much about the history. We dig through graves looking for answers and skeletons. Femurs cannot explain the actions of a mob. Skulls bring no clarity to what cannot make sense. We, voyeurs, glance at the displays encased in glass, tread on well-laid tiles and gray carpet, gaze at photos and videos, knowing we would never wish to be here in 94. But events are safe for us to witness as history, our interest too late to stop what's happened. We scavenge through the past wearing gloves so we aren't infected with its rawness. Sterility is a great distancer of heart and hand. I cannot look away from the pictures. Those who miraculously survived with machete wounds, missing limbs, piles of bodies, rivers of blood, mangled manifestations of division lying haphazardly in a churchyard. I buy no souvenirs to take home. I am afraid to remember. Even though I have no choice, the 250,000 buried here demand we never forget. I promise we're going to do funny pieces at the end. Okay, so um, this, you know, I, I kind of want to dedicate this to um, the folks who were here that were part of our writing today, because, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the power, um, the beauty, the amazingness of art, and this piece is very much about art as creation, because um, I, th I think that those things that we think that we give energy to, that we, you know, put in paper and stone or however we, you know, um, put it out into the universe, that it, it really manifests and it becomes something. So I think it's really important that we're mindful of our words, our actions, our thoughts, because even if we don't see it in our lifetime or in our geography, that stuff's coming to life all over. And we want to see beautiful, amazing, positive things come to life. I awoke in breath. I tripped upon a thought and brought myself into existence on a warm, wet night. I meditated each idea into a star, and then I stretched one open, freeing daylight. Tugging blankets of oceans over my shoulder, I collided on land. I threw sand to the seas. I painted grass meadows until I became impatient with the magnitude of such art, so I tucked myself back into the womb to dream again. Returning to starlight, I found too much white space, so I covered it with daffodils, sunsets, rainbows. I carved clay animals. I kissed them conscious. I let their running footsteps sprout habitats for each and every inclination. Catching the basics of creation on its own, life spread contagiously, carpeting day and night with intention. Meanwhile, I was off planting planets and black holes to grow galaxies. I even twisted time into spiral ropes so I could skip dimensions. Then, sketching stories and equations with constellations across the canvas of my imagination, I decided to pull space wider until every edge disappeared. Now you see why she's a good sister. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So as Tria said, this poem is, uh, 
is about, you know, using humor to deal with, uh, with some, some stuff some that crazy. really works on your nerves. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, you know, and also the idea that the personal is political, so. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, so having said that, <laughs> <laughs> I am so done with men. Okay. Seriously, I'm not playing. Wait. The last guy I was with thought romance was supersizing my drive through dinner. You mean it's not? No. And then the boyfriend before thought that that thought simultaneous orgasm meant we were both present for his. I think I dated him. Right? And don't even try to mess with a brother who thinks he's super fly, 2009, Mr. Mac Daddy Pimp Player. Hey, girl, you look so good. I'm going to have you for breakfast, your mama for lunch, and your best friend for dinner. Mm. And everyone tells me, honey, just find yourself a good man. That's all you really need. But, but what the, the hell, hell does, does that, that mean? mean? Someone to provide for me. You mean pay for me? Someone to take care of me. Oh, as in control me. Just someone to treat me right. What's that? Only irritate me every other night? No, I mm. need so much more than just a good man coming home talking about. Hey, how was your day? But really not listening to a word I say and instead just talking about his stupid old self as a means of foreplay. You think that turns me on? Shit, you, you better, better come, come with, with something, something better, better than, than that. that. Women out there talking about, suck my toe and tell me that you love me. But, but that, that shit is played out. out. How to treat a woman right. How to make a scream all night. Find a G-spot. Go all night and don't stop. But men already read all those books. They found their way to Venus and they set up shop. Selling our liposuction fat. Our saline injected breasts. Our Revlon coated faces. And our insecurities back, back to us. And every time I enter into a relationship, I have to brace myself. Be ready to put up, ooh, and shut up. Check part of myself at the door. Because every relationship involves compromise. Which means me putting up with your lies and lack of understanding about where I'm coming from. See, I try to talk constructed dialectics uh, uh, and oppression theory, uh, and I see you stifle a uh, yawn. You're not even trying to stifle it. And that's when I realize I, I got, got to, to get, get me a political, political man. man. When he walks through the door, drops his dog-eared copy of the automatic, uh, autobiography of Malcolm X on the table, next to the Blackberry and the automatic weapon, of course. Shakes out long dreads or rubs his bald head and then reclines on our African prick couch, but most importantly, has something to say about his day. Hey, baby, I pick it in front of the jail today. Ooh, keep it going. Don't stop. You like that, huh? Well, I, I, uh, I set fire to a Nike store. Ooh, you know how covert actions turn me on. Yeah, I do, girl. That's why I expose oh, government corruption right at the there. highest level. Don't stop. I'm going to dismantle oh, yeah. this whole yes. racist, oh, my oppressive, God. Yes. totalitarian oh, regime and oh, replace it with yes. an egalitarian, <laughs> open, and loving, loving society. <laughs> Now that's some foreplay. Not you, rolling over at six in the morning, humping my leg, talking about... Girl, you wake. With your nasty ass breath all up in my face. Of, of course, course I'm awake, awake now. now. I need to disturb my dreams of a new era with your pacifism. Come on, baby, just let me get a quick hit. Come on, just a little, what, three minute, two minute? You know I can do it in 30 seconds. When what I really want is revolutionary whispers, visions of a relationship where nothing is taken lightly, because the world is serious, times are serious, and we've got to be serious. And seriously, seriously, if you're sleeping with me at night, you best to be marching with me in the morning, because the sound of our feet beating out the rhythms of our hearts and our souls is more earth-shaking than a thousand orgasms. And it's more fulfilling than a million late night rendezvous. See, I shouldn't have to tell you how to touch me. A little me. to the left, a little softer. At little least not down. over and over and Just over again. Mind. Just like I shouldn't have to tell you, we, we got, got work, work to, to do. do. I just want someone to make love to me as if the future depends on it. Because it does. So that was called Political Man. And, uh, you know, we thought we were done having written that. We're like, okay, that's like, our we little got it. We got um, it. We're cool. And then, uh, and then we realized, oh. Uh, wait a minute. We gotta, we gotta write, we gotta write a little bit more on that, cause we didn't say everything we needed to say. <laughs> AKA, we're getting older and bitterer <laughs> as we grow. <laughs> so this is political, political man, man two addendum. What the what hell is, is wrong, wrong with political, political men? <laughs> Brother was fine. And I met him at a free mm. Mumia meeting slash poetry reading, so you know I couldn't help right? myself. But 
while I was talking liberation, he was thinking fornication. And while I was extrapolating on sexism, he was steady trying to get some. Damn, Damn I, I guess, guess I need so much more, more than, than a political, political man. man. Cause how revolutionary men gonna come straight sexist and expect me to lay down and take that? Most of the time we lay down and fake that. Ooh, I guess you was faking when you carried around that bell hooks book. Apparently you never cracked it to take a look. You wanna call me a queen and then you declare war on the monarchy? Look, it's cool you're down to crush the capitalist state. And you've read the collected works of Franz Fanon, Steve Biko, and Huey Newton. That's good, yeah. But don't expect the political to take place of the personal work that you have got to do. And brother, that's, that's a, a whole lot, lot of work. <laughs> I mean, I know I got my own stuff I ain't dealt with, but at least I'm conscious of it. Like that stack of unpaid bills I know I'm gonna have to get to sometime. But you seem to think you have an unlimited credit line that it never passed due. Well, I'm here to tell you, it's time, time to pay up. up. Because we can pontificate on the ills of a hierarchical society for days, but what I want to know is, when did our oppression become a verb we actively participated in? Was it during freedom rides, after Panther food drives, when we uh, were decolonizing the neo-colonialized and rewriting history book lives? No, no, no. Oh. I remember uh, now. Yeah, no, it I was remember. after I let you get some. Yeah, for all your talk, you hit it and quit it just as fast as any other brother on the block. What's my name, girl? Oh. What's my name, uh -uh. girl? What's my motherfucking name? I thought we were planting seeds for the future, but mm. you were just hoeing your crop. When did I love you become something we used like pamphlets and picking signs? A slogan to be shouted instead of a promise to be whispered in the heated space between two bodies. What if I'm tired of broken promises and broken treaties that treat me like a backseat driver on Freedom's train? Women should be quiet, keep to their place. Women should support their men. Support? What, like a wonder bra? Patting, uplifting, contouring, defining, but made to be totally invisible and undetectable when it's really doing all the work. I am not my brother's keeper. I am not my man's maid. I'm not my partner's prostitute. And I am not my boyfriend's mama. Girls, you can need to stop it with this feminist agitation. You're rocking the boat. We'll step to the shores of freedom and then unload the sexist baggage. Freedom, then baggage. Sexist baggage. Uh, that's your issues rolling around the boat threatening to capsize us. And don't try and jump ship by heading for the door. I know the meeting you're going to is important, but so is this conversation we're having. What kind of future can we hope to build when it's built on a foundation of silence and distance? You want to build a global family based on love and respect. But you can't even show the one you love a modem of, modicum of respect? I fought side by side with you. I fight toe to toe with you. But you tell me to bite my tongue till blood fills my mouth that after we win this revolution, revolution thing, thing, we'll deal with our personal Shit. I just don't know how else to tell you that this personal shit is the, the revolution. revolution. I'm sorry if this poem makes you feel uncomfortable, but the time for my silence is done. And really, this piece is about 500 years overdue. Because, see, you just can't be all up in here with your stanky ass drawers hanging in the wind for the whole world to see and smell. And expect me not to tell you, your shit is stank. <laughs> and we wouldn't wear, we wouldn't air your dirty laundry. Wash it every once in a while. And I only yell, baby, because I, I care. Pokey. So, so we did one and we did two. And you know, maybe it's, maybe it's the influence, you know, of things that have been trilogies, you know, because I mean, um, you know, Political Man 2, it's, it's kind of like the Empire Strikes Back of it all, you know, it's like, yeah! Um, but it wasn't enough. We had to do a three. That's um, this is sort of our Return of the Jedi. But opus. without any Ewoks. <laughs> so Political Man 3. I'll cut you, motherfucker! Thank you. <laughs> so. We, we crack ourselves up, hopefully. <laughs> Some of you find this funny too. But it really doesn't matter. I'm like, this is how we get through the day. So, um, so this is uh, this is our last poem, um, sort of about re-envisioning ourselves. Yes. Us. So, I always wanted to be a superhero, Marvel comic book character, action-packed, thrilling, minute type of girl. Just hug my curves and hold your breath. But I do it with a twist because I didn't want to be Wonder Woman or the Bionic Woman. Definitely didn't want to be the Invisible Woman. Shit, I did that every day. No, I wanted to be a black female superhero, kicking booty and looking good. I wanted, I wanted to, to be Storm from, from the X-Men. Command the elements with a single thought, shake entire continents with my wrath, and then I was quiet, the fiercest monsoons. I used to 
too much to be stormed, so when some stupid fool asked me, why, why are you so, so angry? My eyes would whiten with the awesome power of nature. I would raise my hand above my head, power pulsating between my fingertips. The sky would darken and rumble my answer, and then from the bowels of the clouds, a lightning bolt would flash and shoot him in the ass. <laughs> ah, yeah, that, that was, was a badass bad sister. <laughs> then the movie came out. And my hero was played by Halle Berry. Oh, hell no. Storm was a goddess worshiped by entire villages. But she gonna get her butt kicked by a toad with a sticky tongue and somebody with pins coming out of their face? Oh, and Halle Berry does not have the thighs to be Storm, okay? Look at the comics. Sister had some showing off black girl thighs. I'm talking about thighs for days and days, wrap them around your head three times and say thank you, Jesus, kind of thighs. But for the movie, they had to put her on that jazzercise, thin and trim routine. Come on, feel the burn. That's when I realized no known image of black women, created by white men, of course, was going to satisfy my longing to be a superhero. I would have to figure it out for myself. I would have to make myself over into the super soul sister. sister. That's right, the white men will not be saving the universe this time. Not Schwarzenegger, not Willis, definitely not that Daddy, whiny Skywalker. And Uncle Owen, I wanted to go to Tashi and get some power converter. Cause you're not my father. Instead, the next superhero is a sister. And not the generic ratings are going down, and we need about something to perk up the show. Safeway Select of Superheroes. Generic brand of freedom fighter. Oh no, this will be a sister who can fly above the chains of ignorance and whip out the tongue lashing of a lifetime. You think you know me? Well, I call upon the forces of ISIS, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Nefertiti, Asada Shakur, Cleopatra, Shanene from around the way to rain down the furies of degradation, centuries of oppression, and silence on your head. Because we will not be silent anymore. And with the voices of a hundred million sisters moaning across the bloody pages of history, you are gonna feel our rage. Cause I have the power to resurrect the past, train it like a pimple, and stick it on you. <laughs> and we will not be held responsible for the consequences. Instead, I'll be responsible for conquering corporate dominance with a smackdown, ending racial profiling with a swift crackdown. Coming soon to a theater and streets in your town. Ooh, wait, maybe it's Spidey Sense? Could be my super empathy powered third eye. Walita, I sense racism nearby. Yeah, I keep telling her that's not a special power. Mm. That's just simple common sense. Every black woman action figure or not comes equipped with that option. option. Kapow! This mess won't be televised because the networks can't handle this much angry black woman juice, but, but it, it will be in your face. face. And we don't need syndication to open a can of whoop ass five times a week and twice on Sundays. Take that for slavery. That's for segregation. And this is for integration. That's for the glass ceiling. And this is for me being caught up in this corporate matrix. Where I am still Aunt Jemima talking about have a cookie and you'll feel better, Neo. And this is for me not being able to find flesh-colored pantyhose. Or my hair care products at the corner store. Double smack. Forget, Forget the, the Wonder, Wonder Twins. twins. We're the Thunder Twins. Kablam! Not the smirk right off the face of patriarchy. We rewrote history and we started our own galaxy. Beyond the Silver Surfer's mm -hmm. reach, because you know he be trying to gentrify. And, and no, we, we ain't letting you in to fuck up the new solar system, too. Oh, and hell no, the chief of police can't page us with a strobe light shaped like an Afro pick shining on the night sky. Charlie will not be on the intercom, but if he does try to reach us, tell him we have stopped moonlighting his angels because we have come down to Earth and bond our wings for weaponry. And you'll be captivated by our graceful motions as we kick the asses of Judge Sabo, Pete Wilson, George Bush. First and second. Giuliani, Charlton Heston. Chuck, even from the grave, put the gun down and let my people go. Arnold Schwarzenegger. The governator. Basically every great hope that ever, white hope that ever arose. We're gonna whoop them like he was Muhammad Ali and we sting like a beat with a personal vendetta on you. Ooh, like you said something about it. Huh? Right? Because I wrestle with an alligator, I tussle with a whale, I hand up lightning, and I threw thunder in jail. Wait, wait, wait. We need it. it is to replay that so they can watch it again. Ah, uh, sicky, sicky, sicky now. now. Oh, mm. speaking of, do uh, not even try and think about getting some. No. Because we are Clark Kent. And you are not Lois Lane. And definitely not, not the other way around. around. And if you persist in this madness, I will be forced on Fury of Fury of Afro Swipes, Black Bell Jones, and of the Dragon style. Because, because we are Super Soul Sisters. And you got to feel our rage. Thank you all very much for having us. And thank you to all the people in the workshop for your amazing, inspiring writing. We really appreciate all the And thank you to the planners for this. This is such a great event. And it's awesome that you guys stayed here all day. Sweet.